All right, I see a few more people joining us. Welcome. Uh, my name is Mary Hahn, and I am on the board of the Cave Collective. Uh, I'm going to do probably this introduction more than once just because I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to hear who it is that we have um, with us tonight. So we are doing um, a conversation tonight about how art can heal pandemic stress. And so we have with us this evening, Dr. Stephen Manlove, um, who runs Manlove Brain and Body Health. Um, Dr. Manlove has offered to give us some really valuable insight on the ways that nonverbal and nonlinear forms of expression interface and heal nonverbal experiences like anxiety and depression. Um, so as we have a few more people tuning in here, we're just going to kind of give Dr. Manlove a chance to introduce himself um, and anything that he'd like us to know about him. Um, and then I know that he's prepared a visual presentation for us as well. And so you'll be able to kind of follow along. Um, if you're watching this at a later time and you weren't able to tune into the live stream itself, um, you will be able to, to view this conversation at a later time in case you're tuning in late. Um, we can always uh, you can pull it up later and, and start wherever you'd like and, and be able to get the full value of the presentation that Dr. Manlove has put together. So again, I'll say it once more. We have um, Dr. Stephen Manlove joining us this evening. Um, Dr. Manlove runs Manlove Brain and Body Health and is joining us to discuss how art can heal pandemic stress. So with that, Dr. Manlove, I'd love to turn it over to you and just what it is that you have to share with us this evening. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, my, my clinic works on mental health issues. We, we focus on treatment resistant depression, people who've had depression that doesn't respond to normal treatments. And um, so this, this, talk, this, this topic is particularly interesting to me because I've, I've uh, been, a, been observing um, in my practice people who are depressed who can't initiate creative creativity um, or who aren't able to due to their depression. And I've, I've thought a lot about how do, we, how do we reconnect them to that piece because I think if I had the, I've had the gut feeling that the creative impulse was uh, an important part of good health, a good emotional health. And um, so I began to use a little bit extra reading about creativity and the brain and um, began to think about play as part of creativity and the, and the importance of play for the brain. And um, wanted to share some of my thoughts about those things with you folks tonight. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screen share um, and put, show you the Put together some slides and I'm going to just kind of talk about them with you. Um, I'm going to do that right now if that's okay, Mary. Is that all right? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> can you see my, my, my slide here that says how art can heal pandemic stress? Yes, that looks great. Okay. Um, and my understanding is that uh, you, you all will, will, if you have questions or thoughts that you want to share, um, you'll be writing those down and giving them to Mary. And we, will, we can talk about them after this. I, I really don't mind being interrupted, uh, but there, there, there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of you know, reason to interrupt me all the way through this because it's a fairly condensed uh, talk. I'm only going to talk for about 20 minutes or so, I think. Although once you get me wound up, I can, I can go quite a while. Um, so actually, I want to start by just talking about this title. Um, really, uh, that was what I started with, but I, I ended up with uh, the importance of the creative impulse for, for um, he healing depression and for human health in general. So, you know, the pandem pandemic stress is part of the, you know, is one example of how people get depressed, anxious, and so forth. And it is a huge issue right now. We are seeing lots and lots of people who are affected by the pandemic and the current cultural moment, the political situation, who are um, 
having struggling struggling with depression and other emotional problems. Um, let's see. How do I go to my next one? Oh, here we go. Thank you. So this is, I, I thought it was kind of a fun Albert Einstein quote. You know, this is one of the smartest people who's ever lived. And he says, uh, creativity is intelligence having fun. And I think that's right. It, it's, a, it's a different kind of intelligence. And it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, you're gonna get a better feel for that as you, as you look at some of the brain um, um, research that I show you. So this is a picture of a brain. And I can't, can, can you see my, my cursor here? Can anybody see that? Maybe it's, can you see it here? Yeah, I can, yeah. I can see that. Okay, okay. So <clears throat> I just wanna orient you to this brain because we're gonna see a few other pictures of brains that are kind of like this. So this is um, the front of the brain up here at the top. And this is the back of the brain at the bottom. This colorful half of the brain is the right side of the brain. And this gray side of the brain is the left side of the brain. And we are looking down on the brain. Uh, we're not looking sideways or you know, front or back. It's we're looking straight down at the brain in this picture. And you'll see some other pictures that will show cuts through the brain. And I'll, I'll kind of orient you to those too, but um, just get, get a feel for what you're looking at. Really, the, the reason I put this slide up was because we've, we've had this belief for a long time that the right side of the brain was the creative side and the left side was the sort of analytical side. And there, there are some reasons to think that. I mean, the left side of the brain is usually the language center of the brain, but, um, but it's really much more complex than, than that. Um, the scientists now understand that both sides of the brain need to work together, making numerous connections, sending countless signals for the act of creativity to work. So metaphorically, the brain really looks more like this. There's lots of action and it's moving in all kinds of directions. And um, it's, it's not just, uh, and, and it's also incredibly dynamic. The brain, when, when I was, uh, in medical school, learning about brains, we thought the brain didn't change. That you, you know, the way it was when you were born, basically, with a, some a little bit of growth of cells, was about the way it was when you were an adult. We we now know that the brain is com continuously changing, in in you know cellular ways, continuously remapping itself. So this this I, I thought was kind of a cool metaphor for that. So when we think of creativity, there are three, so, okay, let me back up. So we used to think that there are different parts of the brain that do different things. And that is kind of true, but we, we think now that it's really more important to recognize the interaction between different parts of the brain. So we, we know that there are something like 17 circuits in the brain that do different kinds of things, manage different kinds of tasks. The, the research on creativity suggests that there are three circuits that are very important. And you can see these three circuits on your slide. This is the, the, the again, a picture of the brain looking down on it. This is looking at not exactly the top of the brain, but maybe a few, maybe an inch into the brain. So it's kind of the top part of the brain. And this, this shows what lights up when you do um, MR, um, functional MRI scans and people are involved with the default mode network. So the default mode network is sometimes called the imagination network because it is where you go when you are playing, when you're just goofing around, when you're doodling on a piece of paper, when you're screwing around on your guitar, just picking or, or trying to pick on different tunes or thinking of a new tune or it goes, it's where you are when you're um, writing poetry and you just, some words come together 
and they, 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 they seem interesting. And, and when that, when the, so, so you got to be kind of in a relaxed frame of mind to enter the default mode or the imagination network. That's a sort, sort of play you can imagine being in that frame of mind. And I want, I want to introduce one thought to you that thing, and all of a some, some, sudden something cool happens. You think, this is, well, this is, I like this, you know, it's just fun. I like, it's enjoyable. When that happens, <coughs> excuse me, there's part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens that is stimulated by dopamine. So you get a little dopamine burst and that's from a neurological perspective, what makes people feel happiness. So when you're in this default mode and you have a creative moment, there's a burst of dopamine and it affects this nucleus accumbens and you feel good. Um, and that can happen in all, all kinds of <clears throat> play. I mean, it's not just, it can be in the arts, it can be if you're playing a game, um, if you're playing, um, you know, hacky sack, if you're <laughs> shooting baskets in the backyard, um, dance, uh, all kinds of ways. Uh, uh, and and it's, it's also, I, I want to tell you, we, in my office, we do a treatment for depression that's where we give people a, a medicine called ketamine. And ketamine will put people into this default mode network. That's what we're trying to do. Because we think that, and it appears empirically when we look at what happens, that people who enter that mode uh, network, the, the default mode or the imagination network, it helps our depression. And we think that it puts them in a place where they can begin to relax and let their brain play. And the stressors of their world, the pandemic stress, if you will, uh, is not in the middle of their thoughts right now. They can look at that and say, yeah, that's there, it's on the side, but I can just let my mind play. Let's talk about the salience network. That's this middle one here. This is deeper down into the brain. This is a cut about halfway down. You're still looking down at it. This is still the, the front. And this is still the back. And the salience network is, is, is like the operator. It's, it directs input we receive to different areas of the brain for processing. So when you're doodling on your piece of paper or you're thinking going to go in an interesting way or, or playing on your guitar or your piano or whatever it is, and you have uh, something that sounds cool, um, the salience network may, and, and there's a little dopamine release, the salience network may notice that and may say, ah, this is something that's worth paying more attention to because that was really enjoyable and really cool. I like that dopamine release. I like that, the feeling of that. So <clears throat> it, can, it notices it. And then it can say, it, then it can direct that thought to the central executive network, which is the one on the far right. And this again is a cut a little bit deeper into the brain yet. So the, the central executive network is responsible for demanding focused mental activity, sort of like a math problem, but also like, oh, okay, I liked the way those words went together. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember that, I'm gonna write that down. So that is using the central executive network. Or I like, um, I like the sound of that, those you know, few notes that I just played together. That was, a, that was an interesting sound that I hadn't really heard before, but it made me feel good. Um, I'm gonna um, make note of that in some way, whether I'm gonna, I'm gonna memorize it or I'm gonna write them down or do something to keep track of it. That's the central network. People who are really creative, but who are depressed, one of the problems is they, 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 may, they may have trouble even getting into the default mode network here. But when they get there, they may have a hard time. Um, they may not experience that dopamine release that hits that nucleus accumbens. And if you don't, if it doesn't hit that, then you don't notice it. The salience network doesn't have anything to go with. And there's no reason then to 
throw it onto the central executive network. So people who are depressed really, you know, have a hard time being creative. And if you can help them uh, move into a place where they can actually enjoy their default mode network by, you know, again, the dopamine to the nucleus accumbens, then it triggers, then you can begin to put works of art together in different ways. And because the salience network notices it better, moves on to the executive network. So let's see, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into the next slide. This is just kind of reiterating a little bit of what I said, but <clears throat> I just wanna say that the default mode, the imagination network is integral to creative activities like brainstorming, uh, daydreaming, uh, doodling, uh, all those kinds of things. It's also responsible for social cognition. That's your ability to understand what someone else is feeling. So when I'm with somebody, if I, I see, oh, they're, they're unhappy, uh, or without them even telling me, that is my default mode or imagination network working. The, uh, I'm gonna go through these, the salience and the uh, executive network too. So the salience network is in charge of monitoring the internal stream of consciousness. So it's kind of watching that default mode imagination network. It also monitors what's going on in your environment around you. Should I pay attention to that or can I just be focused on what's going on inside of me? It makes the decision as to which information, internal or external, is most adept at solving the problem at hand. It's very important in switching between various brain networks. And in particular, I just want to again mention, it notices things that make you feel good. It notices that dopamine release and the, the effect of that on the nucleus accumbens and likes it, pays attention to it and begins to think about ways of doing more of that. Then the executive attention network, <clears throat> again, responsible for targeted attention and focus involves communication between the lateral outer regions of the prefrontal cortex. That's where the default network was. Remember that picture that I showed you the brain was just about an inch into the brain. So it's the outer part of the cortex. The, the area, the area, it's there the brain responsible for decision-making and complex behavior and uh, areas toward the back of the parietal lobe, which is the back of the brain, which integrates spatial sensory information such as touch and navigation. So, uh, movement, uh, art, uh, artistic movement, dance, that kind of thing. So I mentioned the nucleus accumbens, that's uh, particularly activated during problem solving and the aha moment, you know, it's like, oh, this is an interesting group of words. This is an interesting group of tones. This is an interesting feeling. That's an interesting movement. Um, and it says, aha, this is good, I like it, I want more. So it's activated when joy or reward are experienced. So I wanna just <clears throat> talk a little bit about play and creativity. They're, they're really almost interchangeable in, in certain ways. Uh, you can imagine from what, how I've described the imagination network that it's, re it's related to play. When you play, think of a little kid playing with toys. You know, they're making up stories, they're putting things in different places, putting things together in different ways. It's all, all creative. The importance of play for kids. So play can be conceptualized as a process involving positive affects, that is this dopamine release of interest, enjoyment, and surprise. So when you're playing, you want to keep playing if you're having those experiences. It's interesting, it's enjoyable, and there's newness or surprise creativity. So creativity, it's a little bit more of a descriptive attribute. It's, it means something that is unique or new uh, that characterizes the primary affect processes of play. So uh, there's a, um, a famous philosopher from the late 50s, early 60s named Bertrand Russell. And he said, I call an impulse creative when its aim is to produce something which wouldn't otherwise be there and is not taken away from anybody else. 
So when you <clears throat> when you play somebody else's song, um, in a way, it's taken away from somebody else. So it's not as creative as creating the song itself, right? But you might play, uh, there might be a hundred ways of playing that song that are all a little bit different and are all creative. Um, putting colors together, you know, you may be using the same colors, but putting them together in different ways may be creative. So if it's something that's new and it's, it's, um, it's different than anything that was there before, that's how Bertrand Russell described creativity. I, I thought that was pretty good. I, I kind of like that. So there's a lady, she's a psychologist in, at, University of, at San Diego State University, um, who's really done a lot of research on play. And she's also what you call a generational psychologist, but that's a, a different thing that she does. Um, but in a bunch of research she's done, it comes out that anxiety, depression, feelings of hopelessness, and narcissism have increased and in, in, she's studying young people in a linear manner it seems to mirror a decline in play. So she's studied this over time and looked at the amount of people play over time and sees that it has gone down. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so they're doing, there's less time spent in that default mode imagination uh, circuit. She talks about intrinsic versus extrinsic goals as a model to explain this rise in psychopathology. And she thinks that we've had more and more extrinsic goal focus. So intrinsic goals come from inside of yourself. They're, they're developing competence at activities that you enjoy, like making friends, finding meaning in life, pursuing a heartfelt religious path. Those are all examples. They're, they're not something that somebody, simply, somebody imposes on you. They are all connected to that default mode imagination network circuit. And they, and you can see that they all are things that, that can bring joy um, because you enjoy them. They, they make you feel happy, making friends, finding meaning in life, uh, putting together words in a way that makes you feel happy or listening to a, a lick on your guitar that makes you feel happy. Extrinsic goals are imposed by the outside world rather than coming from within yourself. So getting high grades in school, you know, you do that. Most kids don't do that because they really like the, the way an A looks. They do it because their mother likes the way the A looks or their father. Um, and, uh, and, and another extrinsic goal would be again, to focus on making money or achieving high status. Um, you know, looking good to others, maybe you know, having looking, looking, looking cool. Um, so you get you get the difference between those two. Um, see, she thought that there's a sh there's been a shift from intrinsic towards extrinsic values in the culture at large, and among young people in particular, promoted by mass marketing of consumer goods through television, internet, social media, and just the culture we live in. So this is an example, um, just personal example. You know, I, I, when I was a kid, um, we, didn't, we didn't have like traveling teams in sports. We, you went out and played. You, you, I, so I, I played basketball and I would imagine myself, you know, being guarded by somebody or playing for the Celtics or the Lakers or something. And, and that was, I just would go out and play just because it was fun. Now, now kids are, you know, in structured sports from the time they're really little. The pursuit of extrinsic goals at the expense of intrinsic goals correlates with anxiety and depression. You can imagine if, if you need to get all A's in order to be successful, that's a big, it's a big pressure. With extrinsic goals, the actions to obtain them are typically seen as unpleasant chores. They must be done to achieve desired ends. The connection between the action and the ends are not always certain don't always know you're going to have the end you want. So how does play then, you know, especially intrinsic, intrinsically oriented play um, help mental health? 
what helps people develop intrinsic interests and competencies. Um, so you, you find, find things that you love. It helps people learn how to make decisions, problem solve, exert self-control and follow rules. So um, if you um, are asked to just take some um, crayons and color with them and you don't have lines to color inside of, you might imagine how that would be different than being asked to color within the lines, right? Um, now you've got to decide where everything goes. If you've got a, you know, a picture that you're coloring inside of, there's a lot less decision-making. Um, and that can be extrapolated in lots of areas. And play helps people learn to regulate their emotions. Uh, it helps people make friends and learn to get along with others as equals, partly because you play, you like to play with other people. You know, you might start by playing an instrument, but you might find that it's even twice as fun if I'm playing with a friend, right? I, mean, I bet a lot of you had had that experience. And play helps people experience joy. And if you can find joy in something, it, it reinforces you doing more of it. And it, it, it helps you learn how, actually how to be disciplined. Because if I find joy in playing my guitar, um, it makes me want to play my guitar more. I learned, I, I learned that if I practice, I can do better, even make cooler sounds. Uh, I can learn how to do that playing the guitar. When I need to learn how to do something I don't really want to do, but it's important for me to know anyway, uh, I might be much better because I know how to discipline myself. Okay, so I was I was talking about this intrinsic intrinsic play versus extrinsic play, <clears throat> and I was using this as an example of this kind of the intrinsic play, the the play that is more spontaneous, more like the default imagination uh, circuit. And I, I I just was going on to show um, another example of intrinsic play. These are a couple of girls playing. Uh, Ultimate Frisbee, which I, I think is a, a, a more intrinsic play-like sport because there's no referees. The, um, all the decisions are made jointly by both teams about what, I mean, they're, it's competitive, but there's, but there's they're, they're figuring it out amongst themselves. And I like this picture because it kind of pulls together some of the things that we've talked about here today. And, you know, I, I envision that these people, one, one might have been playing, learned how to, you know, was playing with their guitar and developed a cool lick on their guitar. And uh, they uh, realized that they had a friend who played guitar, so they wanted to teach them. And then they played together, and, and it was even more fun playing it when there was two people, and so they added a drum, and now they've got a, a band, and they're, they're together on this, and they're jamming, and there's lots of... Um, creativity, lots of dopamine uh, release, and uh, lots, of, lots of good feelings. And then this is another sort of picture that I think focuses on you know, extra intrinsic play. This is a kid or person, I don't know, somebody dancing um, by themselves, just have, you know, listening to music and just, you know, Letting it rip, you know, just having a great, great time dancing away. Um, really intrinsic, really default mode. Um, lots of good, good feelings. And I, I like the uh, this other ultimate frisbee picture because uh, there's so much action in it, and grace, and beauty, and um, and excitement, and uh, it's in this in the process of this ultimate frisbee, where where I know there's no referees and it just looks like a lot of fun. And I think the picture, the, the photograph, the photographer captures that really well. So not just what is going on is really cool, but the, the photograph itself really picks that up and uh, made, made these people, everybody, the phot photographer and these people all feel really good because they're part of something that really was creative and unique. And you know, I, I, I think that's what I hear <laughs> happening in places like the Cave Collective. That I, I hear you all getting together 
uh, you've, you've each got something that you're working on cr creating, um, presumably from having spent some time in the imagination or default mode network. And it's it, you, you enhance the experience, the excitement of it, the, the good feeling of it, the joy by sharing it with friends, by getting you know, seeing that people, other people like it and can, can join in with it in some manner, either by watching it or, or actually being there doing it with you. And I think that it, it just speaks to the way that creativity and all, of all kinds can really help us dealing with dark times in our in our culture, like uh, the like the pandemic and the uh, current uh, political you know situation, and um, and so uh, I, I I I think it's I think I think you all have something to really offer the rest of the community and and, your, and each other by by doing the stuff you're you're involved with, with through the Cave Collective. And I hope I've explained it to you a little bit about how how this works in the brain. And, um, and and when I think about treating depression, I'm thinking about how do I get them into the default mode network, and how do I get that dopamine release so that they can have joy, have fun again, and let that reinforce you know more fun actions. So with that, I was planning to stop. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the presentation and for the slides. Um, if you have a few minutes left, I know we went a little bit long just because of the technical issues, so I don't want to take up too much of your time here. Um, but if you have a few minutes, I think we can probably go through a couple of questions if you're able to. Um, sure. So I guess one of the things I have seen come up is, is just the question of if we're not able to um, register dopamine, through the act of creativity, or if if, a de if depression is preventing us from, um, in some way, recognizing that or having the um, rewards of that being transmitted through these different networks in our brain, um, are we able to still gain from that? For for example, if someone is feeling depressed um, and they usually get a lot of joy from playing their guitar, but they're not getting a lot of joy right now. Can just the the almost muscle memory or um, that experience kind of reignite their brain with that dopamine, or is yeah. that? It's a good question. Um, I, I run. This is a question that I deal with every day, with every like maybe five patients a day, yeah. <laughs> and it's. I, and so I always I always ask people what what you know people who are really severely depressed now. I'll ask them what what did you used to like to do. And they might say, yeah, I would used to like to play the guitar. And I'll say, well, maybe you could do that. Maybe that would make you feel better. And they say, I don't want to play the guitar. I feel depressed. I don't, I don't get that feeling when I play the guitar that I used to get. Yeah. And then what I'm hearing them say is, I don't get that dopamine burst. I mean, that's, you know, I, I hear more than that, but neurologically, that's what I hear. And so, what I, what I suggest is let's intentionally do it still. Hmm. Let's, let's get out and play it. Use your muscle memory. And, um, and, and basically it's pretty simple. I mean, you're, you're a lot more likely to, to get the, some pleasure out of it if you, if you do it than if you don't do it. Right. Um, and and, and oh. so we, we, I, I encourage people to uh, so, so this is an actual case that I was, I was talking to somebody the other day and, and they said that they'd like to walk in, in the Black Hills. Hmm. And they said, yeah, it was, uh, it was just always the greatest thing to do, but I don't, I don't want to go for a walk now. And I don't want to be even in the Black Hills. And I said, well, uh, you know, we had a pretty, pretty warm day here recently. I said, well, maybe you could go and go for a walk but I, I want you to go on for a walk and I want you to do a few things. I want you to write this down. Um, I want you to look at the sky and, and I want you to think about the blue of the sky and how, how beautiful it is. Hmm. And then I want you to look at a, a rock formation somewhere along your walk and think about how, how cool that rock formation is. And I want you to intentionally go through the process of thinking 
of, 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 of remembering how beautiful that is. And I want you to look at some trees and think about how cool it is that these living trees can grow out of the rocks in the black hills. Now, if they're really depressed, they still probably can't do that. But if, as, if people are coming out of depression, they might be able to do that better. Huh. And, 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 and so, and if they're not too terribly depressed, that might really pull them out of the depression too. Well, we see, we, we do a, a, a few different treatments that we use for depression that are, are, are fairly, fairly remarkable, I think. But, and we'll see that people will come in and they'll say, I'm not really noticing much. I don't feel much better, not much different. And, um, and then it's almost like there's a tipping point. And all of a sudden, you know, they're saying, yeah, I've got a little bit more energy. I'm feeling a little bit better. Uh, so then using that walk in the hills analogy, they'll go for a walk in the hills and, and they'll say, yeah, it was fun. I liked it. Uh, actually, a literal, a literal case was a guy, I, this is an older guy who said, he, he always loved coffee. And uh, he drank, loved the smell of it, loved to make it, loved the whole process of making a cup of coffee and drinking it. And um, well, when he was depressed, he didn't want any coffee, didn't, didn't do anything for him. And he said, you know, yesterday I was driving home and I smelled some coffee in, in a coffee shop I drove by. And, uh, you know, I decided to stop and uh, go and buy some coffee beans. And I went home and I made some coffee and it was so good and I felt so great. And the, the thing had tipped and he was now able to experience pleasure and, um, and having have that dopamine release. And, and after that, it was just like, everything began to be more fun for him. And so I don't know if that kind of, that's sort of answers that question, but. Uh, yeah, thank you. So it's almost like we can re-travel a path in our mind that has previously led us to joy. And sometimes in that we can like reawaken a sense of joy or, or even just a sense of hope that one day we won't be so joyless, maybe. Exactly. And, okay. and, and think, of, think um, about so the I'm pandemic. Seeing... What, one of the ways we get joy in the pandemic, or we've always get joy, people always gotten joy is by being with each other. You know? now, now we can't be with each other. Mm. You know? So it makes it tough. I'm sorry, yeah. I interrupted you. Yeah. No, you're fine. I'm, I'm seeing a question come in. Um, it says, healthcare professionals are having high rates of burnout. Some have blamed the documentation rules, which sounds like extrinsic constraints to me. Do you have any? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll agree with that. Um, there's not a lot of fun in documentation. It's like doing only the executive mode, you know, that I showed you up there. Um, it's... Um, yeah, so it, it takes, so, you know, the, why, why do people become physicians or healthcare providers of any kind? I mean, it, you might do it because you love the science. That's one reason. Uh, if you don't do it because you like being with people, you're, you're really in the wrong profession. Or and if you don't do it because people, you like helping people feel better, you're really in the wrong profession. So that's why people do it. They don't do it so that they can spend hours um, documenting the way an insurance company. I think company we might works. be losing a little bit of our connection. Okay, I lost you there. Executive function oh. of your brain. Um, and I think. You're back. Oh, we're back there. I, la I lost you for a minute there. That's all right. I lost you also, so I hope we weren't talking over each other too much. Um, yeah, you you just shared that it is it, it's hard when what you want to do is help people, but you're kind of caught up doing the executive functions and. Yeah, I mean it's sort of the poetry of interpersonal relationships that is that is fun and and gives me a dopamine surge, you know, when I or it gives me you know a dopamine you know an aha moment or you know that thing when. Uh, I've worked with somebody and they come in and they say, you know, I'm feeling better, you know? It's like, yeah, yeah, that was cool. That's cool, you know, I feel, I, what I'm doing is worthwhile. Let's do more of it, you know? But when I'm 
filling out paperwork, I'm not saying, yeah, hey, let's do more of it. I'm saying, how can I get this done as easily as quickly as possible? Right. So in your in your own life, when did you start to make that connection between creativity or art and depression? Is it something that was highly studied before you entered the field or is it something that's relatively new um, that you feel like is, is a discovery um, that you've kind of journeyed alongside as it's become more of a professionally recognized journey? Well, I, I think it's all, people have always there's a you know a huge literature, uh, a lot of thought gone into the, the combination. You know, if, if you were to Google creativity and, uh, and and mood, you'd see most of the most of the reports that you'll run into are talking about um, mood disorders and how you know do they increase creativity being being you know say bipolar and being manic or. And there, there are lots of you know, lots of examples of of artists of all different kinds who um, have mood problems that made them seemingly more creative, and it, it, it might may well do that. I mean, being manic may make uh, being a little bit manic might make you more creative. Being a real manic does not make you more creative. It makes you 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 can't you can't makes you think things are really interesting. But other you can't put it together so that other people can. Being a little manic can be really productive. Uh, the and, and a lot of these people then become depressed too. So it's and they, they don't do anything when they're depressed because they they, you know, they don't you know it's no fun. <laughs> then they become a little manic and the creation gets going. And, and so there is that piece of the literature, but there's also a lot of been a lot of thought over the years about things like play therapy um, with children or with adults. Um, using art as a way of, you know, just expressing yourself, being a, 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 a therapeutic process. So that's not new. What I, what I think is, you know, what I, you know, the, the aha moment, the, the dopamine charge I had from doing this talk was um, thinking about the connectedness between how the brain works and creativity and, and how that really fits in with what we're doing to treat depression and how, how I can use that in a more creative way to treat depression. Mm -hmm. For instance, I hadn't thought about um, the ketamine treatments that we use being a way of getting people into the default network. And, and now I, I'm, I'm, I'm much more focused on, on that issue and then trying to direct people a little bit while they're in that network to have a a, a, a pleasurable experience, a fun, a fun experience, something that gives them a dopamine release. Because I, I think, I think that it, it is sort of priming the pump in a sense. Mm -hmm. If you get it going, then uh, you can kind of remember how to do it again. You know. Yeah. So yeah, that's in, in my life. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been there all along. Um, I would say it's been. It's one, one interesting thing I just point out is. Um, I had the uh, unfortunate experience of working um, in a you know organized healthcare setting for about 25 years, and um, and it was really it was all extrinsic value. <laughs> there was a lot of charting and paperwork and um, um, you know following the rules and it was, it was, there were good things about it. I, I don't want to minimize that. And a lot of, a lot of good came out of it. But for myself, um, it was, it was, it was death. And I, I finally realized that and uh, made, made the good decision to stop doing that and to just do what I really wanted to do. Hmm. And, and I, I happened and I thought about it for a few years and thought, what do I really want to do? Maybe I don't want to do mental health at all. You know, maybe I want to be an artist. Maybe I want to be a rancher. You know, I don't know. Um, but I, at the end of it, I thought, no, I, I really, I really, I really do like working with people, and and having helping people work through problems. That really makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. The thing is, I want to do it in a way that uh, I want to be creative with it. And so I, I opened 
allowed that to happen, got away from the extrinsic structure and started just thinking, what, what can I do better without any restraints? And that was about five years ago now. And um, I have had so much fun since then. And I, I, I mean, I have, I, it's just like, uh, in my, you know, my wife would say, um, you know, it's like, what happened? You know, I mean, you, it wasn't that I was, you know, I wasn't depressed really. I mean, it was fine. I mean, I, I wasn't a, a horrible person to be around, but, um, I, well, maybe I was, I don't, I don't know. I guess other people can make that judgment, but, um, I was having fun and I was, you know, I would like want to come home and think about, uh, ways to more creative, interesting ways to do what I was doing. And, um, yeah. So I, even even in the context of a fairly you know a fairly uh, a, a life that's you know, fair what's the word I'm thinking of fair, fairly not not very creative in a lot of ways I mean it's I'm a I'm a doctor you know I mean that, that's just like there's a lot of doctors and I'm a psychiatrist there's lots of psychiatrists um, uh, fairly fairly con conservative kind of uh, uh, job, I think, in, in certain ways, um, I was able to find what finally what I really liked about it, and 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 let that take over, you know. Yeah. Um, which is what should happen. You should do, you should do what is your mission. What what it, what what you should do. Whatever you're doing should a good portion of the time be a, a form of play. Right. Because if you don't, you're not gonna you're not gonna have fun. You know, and you gotta have fun in your life. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think those are all really valid points. I think it's interesting how you've carved out kind of a a place for yourself um, within your profession where you are still pursuing something that you are clearly passionate enough about to go to school to get all of your um, you know certifications and licensing and everything but you found a way to do it um, that brings you joy and that, that, that allows you to have some creative freedom. Um, and I think that that's a really valid um, point to make is that not all art is music, not all art is, um, you know, painting or visual me mediums like that. And, and sometimes just the way that we um, interact with one another and the, the way that we um, use our personalities creatively to give back our best to the world or to our community um, that act of creation in itself is a form of art and i think that's really important um to recognize that some people who say you know oh i don't have any talents i don't have any skills myself for example um i work on this board of incredibly talented people who play music who create art who write poetry um and for myself sometimes it gets a little bit um overwhelming because I'm like oh dear I don't have any of these talents that everyone else seems to share um I do these things you know I love them I I'm so glad that art is in the world um but but how am I an artist you know and mm -hmm. and I are you know even in our community a lot of kids who who have questions similar to that who say you know well how you know how am I supposed to artistically give back to the world when I don't have any talents and to recognize that the thing that brings you joy is in itself an act of creation, I think is really powerful and something that um, is a really good message, especially for young people today. Say, like, you you don't have to follow this particular path as an artist, um, but the the way that you enjoy in your life, the way that you create light that draws people to you, and that sort of magnetism is a work of art in itself. And I think that, like you were talking about, um, bringing the the recollection of the paths in our brain that have brought us joy before, bringing that to the forefront of our mind, even at the times that we can't feel that joy, um, to help ourselves remember that that joy can be there, especially in the midst of a pandemic when people are suffering from isolation and depression and despair, just on astronomical levels, I'm sure, um, to remember that that joy is still there and it can still be recalled and it can come back to us um, in new ways or in old, I think that's really important. And I like hearing that, you know, play therapy is such a big part of that. It's really cool that you brought that to our area. Um, I saw a comment about that 
on the Facebook Live just saying that um, one of the commenters said that they have multiple friends who have benefited from the type of therapies that you use. And she said, thank you so much for bringing that sort of therapy to the hills and to our area because how cool that we um, are able to access that. And um, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. Are there any other local um, resources or, or online resources that you would recommend for anyone who's like, oh my gosh, like I want to rediscover joy. I want to remember what it is to play. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, like, yeah, make an appointment with you. But um, is there anything that you would recommend just as a starting point for someone who maybe is feeling watching this right now saying like, I'm depressed and I don't know how to recapture any of that. Where do I even start? Would you have words for them? Yeah. Um, I think it's important to um, find somebody to talk to about it. And, you know, that's, that's a pretty broad statement, but so there are, you know, that could be, might be a friend, it might be a mentor, it might be a trusted person in your life. It might be a, a psychotherapist. Um, it might be um, a teacher, coach, you know, a, somebody who's helping you improve your art. Um, I, I think coming out of the closet, so to speak, with that is, is important. Not, you don't need to tell the world about it, but because it, it, for starters, it's, it's a, really, a really lonely thing being depressed. And just having somebody else know about it is a is a big can be a big help. And then uh, and then, I I, I think um, I, I think there's you don't need to undergo psychoanalysis or something like that. Um, it's not not wrong to do that either. But um, uh, but but kind of have somebody help with you think about how do you just do the kind of. Remember the things that were joyful for you and, and begin to do those again. I think that's a great starting place, whether that be yeah. a therapist or a friend. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, there are, there are lots of things that we, you know, we, we do, we, we do all of those things, but we do, other things to medications, transcranial magnetic stimulation, ketamine I mentioned. Um, and we, but we, we always are working with people on, on their lifestyle, um, uh, their sort of how they're thinking about things too. And you know, sometimes you need the TMS or the ketamine. Sometimes you just need to, to work on how do you get yourself, your body, and your brain healthy again. And, and sometimes that's right there is enough to, to you know, tilt the, tilt the, uh, the, the, the scale in, in yeah. favor of getting through it. That's awesome. Thank you so much um, for the time and the effort you put into for, for putting up with our techno technology um, issues there. And thank you for um, the presentation, uh, for being with us tonight. Again, this is Dr. Stephen Manlove um, of Manlove Brain and Body Health. You can follow their um, Facebook page. You can visit their website. Even if you just Google Dr. Stephen Manlove, this is the man who comes up. Um, and we are the Cave Collective. You can follow us um, on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram at the Cave Collective. You can visit our website at www.thecavecollective.org. And we're going to continue these community conversations. Um, I know next week we have another one planned for the same time. We're going to be on air again on Thursday night at 6 p.m. And um, we're going to continue this and in a way find our own joy through these, these connections and these moments when we are able to inspire one another to recapture our joy, um, especially in these times when it's really difficult to um, build community and to to interact with one another and everyone is feeling kind of the the weight of the isolation i think it's really important to tune into conversations like these and, and learn um, some tools and some mechanisms that we can all utilize to just recapture our joy and and build that spirit of community so again we'd like to thank dr manlove for being with us tonight um, and for sharing so much of his time and his expertise in this subject um, this 
video will be a, a, available. Um, we'll edit out the, the technological issues um, and we'll put it all together. It'll be available to view um, on our Facebook page or on YouTube. We'll have it um, so that you can access it at a later time in case you tuned in late this evening. And again, we just want to extend our heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Manlove and to all of you who tuned in this evening. Thank you so much. Um, feel free to message us with questions or um, any other things you might be interested in learning. We'd love to have more ideas for our community conversations coming up. So again, Dr. Manlove, thank you so much for joining us tonight and we'll be in touch with you. And thank you for you know, the Cave Collective for doing how you do. I think this is a fantastic uh, service for the community and for a great way to pull people together. And you know, there's, there's lots of joy that comes out of being with other people that uh, we can at least access a little bit here. And uh, you know, someday we'll be able to actually be together again. <laughs> yes, looking forward to that. Well, thank you again, doctor. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.